Hi, I'm Eddie Burke. I've been the bartender at the Hollywood Improv for 40 years, and this is my podcast, Eddie's Bar at the Improv. All right, guys, this is Eddie Burke. Welcome to another episode of Eddie's Bar at the Improv podcast. Hey, I want to thank you all for listening. I want to thank the Improv for letting us do this here. I also want to remind you that anytime you want to come in and see me, you do not have to go to the show. I'll be the show. So just show up. I have today I have an actual longtime friend as a guest who's going to blow your mind with stories. <laughs> Mr. Tom Tully. Mr. Tully, thank Hello, you thank so you, much Ed. for being here. My pleasure. Here. My pleasure being here. This is great. You I was are- so happy to be at your 40th uh, party, you know, that we celebrated you. That was that was a trip. I, I was overwhelmed, flattered, you, you name it. That I was, was so great. Your kids yeah. were there, and, you know, it was family, wonderful. Congratulations. Every, thank you. And most people didn't believe I had a family. Well, <laughs> they're like, wonderful. They're great. They're, they're there. Oh, I love your wife and your, and your, and your son. Well, and your easy, daughter. easy, they're easy now. Uh, they're great. Well, first of all, <laughs> let's drink to this Absolutely. little com- tell you this, what. We're conversating. Uh, you bet. You and I about... I've known you actually uh, since I started here. Yeah, what year was that? Uh, that was '79. Yes, and yeah, I that's believe when I you were already yeah. you were here. I had with, just gotten here yeah. with uh, Off the Wall. You started working with Off the I Wall. I did, then. absolutely, absolutely. How, you came from Chicago, I, I believe. Did. I did. We had you know second cities in Chicago, and I had I had to graduate from DePaul Law School and, and decided the law was really boring. Oh, by the way, two things I want to say before we really get into this is one (laughs) is I'm sure somebody else canceled is the reason I'm here. But uh, (laughs) that's 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 fine. That's fine. But number two is you will never see a better Eddie Burke podcast because you will hear things that we when we finish these wines we're drinking, you'll start to hear some some absolutely true things that happened here way back when. Okay, well. When, when did you start doing? Uh, well, I, let me let me start by saying this: You're an actor, you're a celebrity impressionist, you're a voiceover artist. Uh, a I'm sketch a producer comedy. right now. I've got my my, my show Top Tune, which right. you'll be seeing on TV soon, a show that I co-created and um, very happy about. But yeah, I've been you know you got to keep reinventing yourself if you want to stay in this business, especially today. I oh, mean, boy. With, with all the avenues and yeah. all all the competition that's out there. Absolutely. Well, let, let me give let me give the people though an idea uh, of what life was like in 79 80 81 82 when it, when I first came into town there was a comedy gold rush it was a boom town because uh, stand up comedy which hadn't had been limited to a, a very small field of people suddenly there was a a, a boom in, in like Every, every town in America, Kankakee, Illinois, had three comedy clubs, okay? The A, B, and C club. And, and everywhere you looked, every, everybody suddenly wanted to go and hear stand-up comedy. And, of course, the comedy store and the improv were the two biggest places in the world to have these. Now, of course, Bud and Mitzi hated each other, which made it even more fun, you know? <laughs> right. And, oh, my God. So when I got here, it's sort of like the 49ers, you know, coming out to the, the, for the California Gold Rush. Or 1901 when they went up to Alaska to look for gold. There were people out here that were trying to turn comedy into gold. And there were tons of them. And they were also quite a number of the biggest nutcases you (laughs) will ever meet in your life. Welcome to Hollywood. I mean, there was a guy, I remember he used to stand outside. He had tried to be a comic and he went bust and he he was dressed in rags. And he would write jokes and uh, people, people like Jay Leno would buy them. You know, for five dollars, and it was it never used them, of course. You know, and but I mean, it was that kind of time where it was a floodgate of mm-hmm. people that that came in. And what happened was, I got, I did get involved with this group off the wall. And you want to hold that up for us, yes, sir? Yes, sir. And uh, you know what? We were the we were the house act for nine years for nine years for fourteen years every, every Monday night. Every Monday night, I remember it well. Oh, oh, oh sorry, whoa, oh, whoa, yeah. whoa, yeah. whoa! Well, oh, <laughs> Okay. Got me. Oh, dear. Sorry. So, see, I told you it would be unusual for uh, a <laughs> cab. <laughs> and it was. And it was, and it was. Sorry about that. That's all right. I uh, picked up my pictures the wrong way, and I, I'm totally at blame for that. That's why you were a fill in. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I don't have any. Okay. 
That's, that's a, you, that's you, a, where's a bar rag when you need one? <laughs> this is called improv. Absolutely. <laughs> That's so right. we did, uh, I'm sorry about that, but we did Monday night uh, for, for uh, 14 years, and it was an incredible, incredible time because it was extremely popular. Now, Mondays was Bud's poker night, so we never saw Bud here. But, of course, Mark was here, and, uh, you know, he loved and supported That's Mark Brown. Lano. Yep, and uh, Mark Lano, one of the owners of the club. Yeah. Don't spill, this is yeah. the other uh, one. The Don't wine spill. I would never spill, but okay. So we, um, sorry about that. We had, um, <laughs> that was my first drink, too. Uh, anyway, we had the, uh, please, the, we had the, uh, <laughs> the first yeah, guy yeah, to get it. cut off on this podcast. <laughs> he just ruined off the wall oh, I got a, the first 10 years. A couple of those. But we, we performed here, and we worked with, uh, with this guy, uh, who became famous largely because of us. No, actually... He had uh, been performing all over the place. Is that Robin something? But his name is Robin Williams, and there he is. And are we getting that? Okay. And then uh, this is us on stage performing and doing our little act here. And uh, what happened and was... And he was part of oh, yeah. Off the Wall at If one he point. was in town, oh, yeah, he, initially he was uh, in the group, and then, uh, you know, the, the, he, he, did, um, he did Happy Days, and from that he did Mork and Mindy. And, uh, you know, got his own TV series. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but any time, you know, Robin was a stage whore. And any time <laughs> he could uh, come in and perform, he would definitely take advantage of that privilege. And he would come and work with us every Monday. And the great part about the comedy Gold Rush, the boom, was the number of people. I mean, uh, Will Chamberlain, Mike Tyson, uh, Peter Ustinov. And, you know, we had three really big fans that came in all the time. Gene Hackman, Shelley Winters, and Carol O'Connor from All, all in the right. Family. Mm -hmm. And they would come to all of our shows. And it was like, you know, I mean, here are these people that, uh, you know, that I've seen in, on TV in Chicago, and here they are coming in and participating in what had become this, this event, this, this, this time in history where everybody was involved in we, improv. We, one of the things the improv was known for at that time was that every Monday night was off the wall yeah. with sketch comedy. We are called the improv and basically we don't have improv. Right. Except for Monday nights when off the wall was here and well, the, the it other, was always packed. Oh my God, guys. the other great part about that was that uh, uh, Johnny Carson usually took Monday nights off and, mm -hmm. and Tuesday and he had it in, in those days the Tonight Show was an hour and a half. So he would always have the, the hottest young comic on Tuesday night. Well, that meant that Monday they would start at the comedy store and do their act, you know, to get ready for Carson and then maybe go somewhere else and then come here and wait till midnight till we get off stage. So Roseanne Barr, Jerry Seinfeld, you name it. Any, yeah. Anybody who was anybody, you know, would come in and they would watch us. They would stand up. I remember you know, watching them in the back. They would wait for us to get off and then they, they, they'd get on stage, compliment us and then do their five minute bit that they would be doing on The Tonight Show. How did you get started with Off the Wall? I dated one of the actresses in it. Uh, uh, basically, known. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> what, you know, what better way? Yeah, really. Uh, no, the, 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 I, I, I'm kidding, but um, you know, we, uh, Bernadette and I, uh, was a good friend of mine, Bernadette Burkett, came out from Chicago and Off the Wall was going through a transition period and they needed uh, two people. They needed a man and a woman and we fit the bill perfectly. And Bernadette also, and I had worked at the comedy store, and she was in the comedy store players that, uh, that uh, you know, w w worked over there and did, did some comedy. But I, I, I could tell that Off the Wall was a much better bet for us, you know, because mm. it was a perfect fit. And we, uh, you know, to this day, we, do, we, can, we continue to perform together and, uh, and love the, to perform. Off the Wall still does perform, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we're over, over in Culver City at the Fanatic Salon once a month, the uh, last Sunday uh, of the month. Did, did you ever do stand-up? I did a little bit. Um, you know, I did stand up just enough for Robin Williams to steal some of my jokes. <laughs> Here's what happened. We would do Ted Koppel. We would do Nightline, you know, and I would go, good evening. I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. And then we'd, talk to, and we'd get a suggestion, and let's say the hostage situation. And Robin would be one of, my, one of the people, one of the panelists on the show, you know, and he'd come on, 
And I go, and uh, from uh, southeastern, western uh, uh, Alabama is Coach Pap Smear. Uh, good evening, <laughs> Coach. And uh, Well, I do, Ted. Yeah, I know what to do about that hostage. Let's take a, a truckload of Alabama National Guardsmen over there, and we'll just, we'll just beat the hell out of them, you know. <laughs> Robin would just go off, and he was a very great person to work with on stage. Now, he was a hairy man, and he smelled <laughs> something terrible uh, because of some of the drugs he would do. But he just sweated a lot, you know? Uh -huh. But audiences were crazy about him. I mean, they would explode when Robin Williams came on stage, you know? And he'd bring Whoopi and Bruce uh, Willis, Willis with him. He, there was always a big crowd, uh, you know, that wanted to see. That's how I met the, um, uh, the Weinstein brothers. You oh. know, they came in here one night. It was so this Spielberg. is how you got ahead, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> and I went, okay, hi guys, you know? But everybody came to see uh, uh, Robin. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, and then we also had other very popular guests, you know, we, we, we would... Uh, Who do you remember, John, like... John Ritter, George Went. I was just going to ask that. Who do you remember popping up on stage with you guys that might have just come in to watch or... Uh, or uh, uh, you know, there was an author named Jerzy Kaczynski. Do you remember him? Sure. Mm -hmm. We pulled him on stage one night. We were doing book beat and we got him up, we got him up there, you know, but he, uh, he kind of faded uh, on us. But, uh, you know, people would just... Because uh, we, we did play a game toward the end of the show where you could with freeze tag where people would freeze and then run on stage you know and uh, replace one of the actors and then start a brand new scene and and, and that was difficult because we had a girl named space ass and uh, somebody else i forget her name but i think i know her in fact i've known her every to, year to jump out so we had to really uh, limit that participation oh i know what i want to talk about Dance night. Oh my God. Uh, one Christmas, Loretta, who was a head bartender here at the time, wanted to dance because Loretta was always looking for a new guy. And so she, she would get lonely sometimes and she'd go, damn it, I want to dance. And sometimes the girls would do it on top of the bar. Yep. But uh, they were very pretty. We had beautiful waitresses. I'm sorry, uh, bartenders and, and waitresses too. But anyway, they wanted to have dance night. And so they uh, did it one Christmas Eve or something. And um, it was, and then we, it, it became after the, sh the show, every Sunday night mm -hmm. was dance night at the improv. And it got so popular that Bud bought the building next door, tore the wall down, and extended the club. And, 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 the, and it, was, it, it, it was like a line around the block. Mark began charging like $11 to get in. Because Just, only because it got so crowded, yeah. and he had to oh. kind of limit it. <laughs> he tried to, but he, but but eventually the uh, the reader came out with a, uh, a story and said, if you couldn't get laid at dance night at the Improv on Monday, then you didn't have a a, a member. So uh, <laughs> then they had they had to they, uh, oh, and then the neighborhood complained that people were fornicating on the lawns. No, absolutely, and and because they had extended dance night to Sundays as well. And so they, they outlawed it. They, we had to stop dance night. It was too popular. That's right. That's exactly why the neighbors just got a little bit tired of our people going down the street and, uh, like you said, doing things on the lawn oh, God. when people could water their own But, lawns. I mean, it got to be so, uh, so insanely popular. I'll tell you another thing that I did, the person that I did meet that I'm uh, almost, I rarely tell the story, but uh, there was a gal named Susan Berman who was a writer, and she was a fan of Off the Wall. And she uh, brought Robert Durst one night. Ah. Now, this is the guy who, you know. Who killed just, her. Who killed her. <laughs> yeah. In fact, um, uh, I had met Durst because of my neighbor went to grade school with him in New York because my neighbor grew up very wealthy and the Durst family had owned half of New York. And uh, I just thought, boy, this is a weirdo. And so then I found out his first wife had disappeared. And so I said to Susan, you know, that guy's pretty true. He goes, oh, no, he's all right. He's all right. Those are all lies. <laughs> Of course, the guy later on chopped up a guy in Texas, another neighbor. But uh, there were, my, my friend, Nancy, was going to have a birthday party for me. Now, my birthday is on December 23rd, which is the worst day of the year to have a birthday because people are either shopping or traveling. So she was going to invite uh, this gal, uh, Susan, with, uh, with Durst. Uh, Durst, and that was the night she was murdered. <laughs> oh, wow, really? Oh, yeah. And you know who else uh, would come in here was the juice. Uh, along yep. with uh, uh, Will Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and you know, the O.J. Simpson is very charismatic. And he loved our group. And he, he would, you know, he, he loved to be being out and about. Eric, uh, the running back, w was also in here. He dated the... Eric. Uh, Eric. Uh, Dickerson. Dickerson, mm -hmm. yeah. He, yeah. So anyway, they'd come in here. Uh, and um, so... Wilt, Wilt never left alone. Wilt was always here. 
Yep. And he would he sit here where alone. I'm sitting right now. He went, he went, never left alone. Oh, no, no, no. No, he never did. But he was a very sad man in many ways. For a guy who was seven foot one, he was the smallest guy I ever met. Yeah. I mean, he just had a, he had a very bad self-image. I don't know what the problem was. But the bartender did not like him. He was a, he was a kind of a cheapskate. But he would sit at the bar quite often. But the, uh, the thing about the juice was that uh, one night, I don't know if it was the Lakers, there was a playoff game with Houston. And so we came in here to watch it. And you were here, I think. And so uh, I had come up in the car and I said, you know, the, there's a chase. They're chasing OJ. And there were these guys from Houston. They wanted to watch the Rockets. And they go, oh, no, no, don't turn that on. Don't leave, leave the NBA game on. And so they, eventually they cut away from the NBA game, which was very unpopular at the bar. But I'll never forget uh, standing here watching this incredible chase I do of, remember of, uh, this. of O.J. Simpson. Yep, and, and I guess he got caught. Oh, yes, he? oh, yes. And, uh, you know, there was another night, I, I don't think you were here, but there was a popular uh, recording artist who had a TV show. Uh, I'll just say her name was Connie, okay? And um, <laughs> I'm not going to say her last name because she's still alive. Anyway, she had divorced her husband, and she was going out with this guy, who was dating a girl who worked across the street. What was the name of the old restaurant over there? The Moustache. The Moustache, right. And she was sitting here drinking at the bar waiting for this girl to come in, which we didn't really know at the time, but we're going, oh, there's Connie, yeah. And so then she sees her, she bolts up, boom, she goes across the street, and suddenly there's this cat fight. And I mean like this huge fight, you know? And we're like 40 guys, 30 guys at the bar, we're like cheering, you know? And uh, two minutes later, the cops arrive, and they put her in handcuffs, you know? And she goes, I'm Connie, her last name. And uh, they, they take her away. But um, think, almost anything typical. could happen here. And it did. It I did. I mean, you know, they, the, the fights themselves were kind of oh, yeah. infrequent, which, which is uh, a good thing. They were very infrequent, yeah. How did you get started in uh, sketch comedy? Why did, what, um, at what point did you say to yourself, like, you know, later for law? Right. You know, I, you know what? I had majored this. in theater at Southern University, and I was, a, I was taking, a, I was a, going to law school at DePaul downtown, and I took this dance class, you know, where I met David Ruprecht, who was, who okay. was in Off the Wall later on. And, um, you know, I did, because there were pretty girls there, and I, didn't, and I wanted to move, because a lawyer, you don't, all you do is sit in, an, in a library and read when you're a law student. And so um, I just thought, boy, this would be so great. And I met uh, this gal named Ann Ryerson, who said, you know, you should try out for Second City and or, or go to Dell's class. So Dell Close was the teacher at Second City at that time. And uh, I started taking the class there and kind of my life began. I realized that I had found my tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, I found the group of people that excited me. Did you ever practice law? Yeah, yeah. For a couple of years, I had to repay all the uh, loans Student I had loans. taken out. Mm -hmm. But I, I settled a big case. And then I came out here. I had come out here partially in 79. But then I moved definitively on January 1st, 1980, uh, to be here, and I just, you know, divorced. Because two roads diverged in a woods, and I wanted to, uh, to do what I'm doing, you know. I didn't really want to. Now I still, you know, my niece is, is a public defender, and I, I still look at the odd case here and there. And, you know, I, I'm still interested in the law, but, but, uh, but the... And the people, thing, do, people do question what you're doing. Oh, yeah, of you course. Know, but, we're, we're still but, you know, the difference between being a lawyer and being an improviser, and, and being a lawyer is, is constant argument, and being an improviser is constant agreement. So uh, the yes and principle really works for me. I, I, I really enjoy... Well, you took the more exciting path. Oh, God, yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. Rather yeah. than... Uh, Half the guys I went to law school with are dead. <laughs> rather than arguing some case for, for whatever reason. Oh, yeah. And how did you get involved in uh, being a celebrity impressionist? And you did Robin... Yes, I did. Uh, I did Robin Leach. Leach? Um, I don't know. You know, they got hired to do this uh, thing, and this lady said, you can do anything you want with it. And I said, well, I, and I, I was the MC, and I, and I was trying to think, and I went, well, you know, I can do Robin Leach. Hello, it's me, Robin Leach of Lifestyles of the Rich and Obscene. I haven't seen you since Monte Carlo. How oh, look, I would pretend the people were rich and famous. Well, this became really popular for me. Mm -hmm. And I got a bunch of great gigs, you know, and I would go down to, uh, you know, places. They'd fly me all over the country, and I would be Robin Leach Jr., basically. <laughs> and, um, you know, this was a... Just, just kind of came out of... Just kind of came out of it. Yeah. 
Well, so that was good. And you and I did a looping jobs together. Yes, we did. We did voiceover work. We did looping jobs. Uh, and I got into that because of you. Well, yeah, that was you know, my that pleasure, was a, you know. Um, it was a connection made through Tom Tully. Absolutely. And, uh, we had a lot of good times and some good residuals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and, and actually, voiceover work for me was always a lot of fun. I mean, oh, God, you know, yeah. It was just it's uh, acting and putting yeah. words in people's mouths, you know. And making a few dollars. And, yeah. And that never hurts, along with, with the, uh, the residuals. Did, where did uh, how did you how did you get into the looping scene? Yeah, uh, D. Marcus again, who started off the wall, uh, had a had a super loopers, and so the, the, the very first couple of years of Hill Street Blues, I did all the shows with the kids, and we would do we did this is Elvis. Well, wait, since you brought up Hill Street, that's because one of the cast members was also a member of Off the Wall. Betty Thomas? Betty, well, Betty, Betty, that was just a coincidence and, and a good one. Actually, one of the producers uh, had studied with Dee, and, and uh, that was our, 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 our road in. I can't think of his name, but he came, became a film director. But he uh, got us the gig, and it was, in those days, you know, they didn't realize how, how, how good of a product they had. So we would do, we get three concert tracks in one day. We do three episodes, which is like mm -hmm. gold, you know. After after their second season, they began to take themselves very seriously, and so <laughs> we had to do every, it would be one day, one contract. But I mean, it was a, it was a remarkable uh, way to um, to stay alive because you know uh, when I had first come out here, there was a thing called the comedy strike, yes. and what that was was Mitzi at, at the comedy store wouldn't pay anybody. She thought, look it, you're getting all this you know chance to be, you know get on TV, and it was true. A lot of people were getting recognition and that. And, and Bud would pay, but, but not terribly much. But anyway, uh, the comedians like Jay Leno and, and uh, David Letterman, uh, they, they, all, they went on strike for a couple of weeks, you know. And uh, in fact, to this day, people that cross the line to work are, are you know, are still considered, you know, well, and then, uh, uh, then Mitzi's boys decided to try to burn down the improv. They, they, there was a big <laughs> fire here, absolutely. Yes. And, Eddie uh, Thomas was here that night. That, um, I I was not working here then, but I it was ended a grease up fire here. in the kitchen. No, it was it in a showroom. Oh, it, and was. it was purposely set. Wow! And now, see, now that I did not know. I believe on his deathbed, a comedian named Biff Maynard. Yeah, sure. Gave Bud Friedman and his attorney a deathbed statement. Wow! As to who started that fire, and I believe again, I believe it was Ali Joe Prater. You know, Ali's name was, yeah. was tossed in there. Ali Joe Prater was the guy who crossed the line. Uh, was a very heavy set uh, comedian who uh, somebody said that he died of room service. <laughs> that was the cause of his death. But he, you know, he would do anything for Mitzi. And you know, the only, the only reason the comedy the, the only reason that strike ended was that there was a comic who went up to the 6th floor of the hotel mm. next to the comedy store and jumped off. Yeah. He died. And That's, that ended it. They realized that they had, they were they had a golden thing here, and they were they, they better take advantage of and it. And I'll I'll push that guy's book, not the guy who jumped, but the uh, it's called I'm Dying Up Here. Oh yeah, it has nothing to do with uh, with the uh, Showtime series, right. but it, it was it, it was a very informative and pretty precise. I talked with him a couple book. of nights, yeah. So if, if anybody wants to read it, that's actually not a bad a bad read if you want to find out about that era of comedy. Oh yeah. Mainly at the store, but it's still it, it uh, gravitated over this way too. You know, Andy Kaufman was another very interesting and unusual individual, and he used to have a gal who he pretended was his little sister. Now I dated her. That was my girlfriend for a while. Little squeaky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's about <laughs> she's from New York. She's about five two, real pretty, and um, that was a uh, situation where he was, uh, you know, had, had advanced uh, cancer and was dying, but he'd still show up here. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, we thought it was a gag, you know. And he would come in with Zamuda, and then they would dress it as this silly character, and then afterwards, Zamuda would show up pretending to be. Andy Kaufman dressed and Tony as Clifford. Tony Clifton, yeah. Clifton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that was a uh, a crazy scene. It was it was it was it was very tragic because he had been voted off Saturday Night Live, which was a which was should have been a joke. But uh, well, he, well, he was he was Bud, quite a uh, Bud Friedman threw him a going away party when he was dying. I mean, if you talk you you, you want to 
hear all the funny things that that went on nobody as you said believed he was actually dying no, no we did not we everybody did absolutely thought, not even the, even the girl that was his sister yeah everybody she, she, thought it was a joke we and thought it was they, a gag because mm-hmm. that's how andy worked yeah he would go to extreme for, for two weeks he went out in the valley and worked at uh, one of the delicatessens as a bus boy <laughs> And he and, and he and he would always be in character, you know. And he and Carol Kane would come in here, you know, and um, some of the other cast from uh, from Taxi. And uh, you know, everybody loved Andy, but he was very difficult to work with. He was just a you know just well, a professional. He's one. Of, he was one of those people, one of those comedians who really went the distance in pushing the envelope. He oh, wanted God, to yeah. see yeah. how much you could take and how right. much you would let him do and. I've mentioned this story before, and that was him going up on stage, having a table brought up, ordering food, eating it, calling for the check, paying for the check, and leaving. Yep. Oh, yeah. And that's it. And the people just sat there and watched it and took it, and, and you know, it was Andy Kaufman, so I guess it's funny. You know who is a very funny comedian? Larry David would, would, mm-hmm. uh, would perform in here. But Larry David is a, is, is a brilliant man, but he's a perfectionist, and he would come in and he'd have his list and he'd get on stage and he would want to do uh, some of the things that he thought was funny and wanted to do in front of the audience. And boy, if that audience didn't laugh at the first, after joke three, <laughs> he would storm off the stage. Mm-hmm. And all the comedians loved to watch it because he was a comics comic and mm-hmm. that he made comedians laugh. So, because he always did different stuff. And so he would, uh, he was quite a character. And of course, Jerry uh, Seinfeld would come in here uh, quite a bit as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, all the women were crazy about Jerry. They all wanted to. Well, Jerry uh, cut his teeth here. I oh, mean, yeah. you know, he he got started here. Larry, well, I, when I say get started, I don't mean they told their first joke, but they grew no, here. Absolutely. And uh, Larry and Jerry, Bill Maher, George Wallace. Sure. This was all their home club. This I'll was, tell you the story that you and I know is that is when Paul Reiser came to town. Now, uh, Paul Reiser is a very funny comedian. And his material has nothing to do with Richard Lewis, okay? Mm-hmm. But for some reason, Richard Lewis was convinced that Paul Reiser was, not just his material, was stealing his persona, <laughs> which he vaguely looked like his younger brother, I guess, okay? So, what, what, and this is the days when Richard was drinking. And um, so, when Paul would go on, Richard would leave the bar and he'd go into the showroom and he'd stand there like this. The whole time Paul was on stage, you know, and so now Bud has to deal with this insane right. perception that somehow Paul Reiser is stealing Richard Lewis's persona, not his material, but his persona. And so uh, Bud said, all right, uh, you're banned from the improv for two weeks. Change your persona. And Paul goes, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> what does that mean? He goes, I don't know. But, but uh, you come back in two weeks. And so that's how he said it, because Richard was one of his headliners. Right. See? So you didn't want to cross that line, you know? Yeah, that, it, it's weird how, uh, well, you know, Richard, I love Richard. Oh, I've God, known yeah. Richard forever. Well, now, now that he's sober, he's a different guy. Too. But you, you talk about neurotic, and it, it's, uh, he's probably the classic example oh, of the God. neurotic comedian and, and such a sweet man and, and such a funny man and talented actor. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. But, you know, we all have our little idiosyncrasies oh, yeah. with, with all of that. Because oh, yeah. you mentioned uh, Andy's, uh, whatever, little... Little sister. Little sister. Um, if you're out there, by the way, call me. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember your name, but call one me. Of, one of uh, the former bartenders here, uh, who I actually got my job through, Steve Morgan, uh, he and I actually went up to the apartment of of her and uh, her, another little friend and we thought okay you know we'll have a little fun or what have you and and in there uh, we felt like we were in Charles Manson's uh, living yeah, room yeah. all they did was talk about Andy yeah oh yeah and Andy had in a their following sque- uh, following you talk about these little girls this was a cult well, this is a different girl then and uh, well this was like this was, uh, that's all right, Tom. It's okay. Well, I think so. I think so. Because I spent a lot of time in the school department. They just, they just kept on going, oh, Andy is so great. You know, maybe he'll come over later and, and, and all that. And we're going like, we're looking at each other like, well, maybe Andy's coming over later and we better go. Because better there ain't nothing happening here for us. But, you know, the truth is that that big round, you know, round table, they call it, just like the Algonquin Circle, right, in New York. And so the... Many famous comedians from days of yore mm-hmm. would show up, like Milton Berle, uh, Phyllis Diller, 
uh, a lot of people that I got to know quite uh, quite well, Phyllis, I had worked with in Chicago, and you know they they would come in here and they would sit with Bud or somebody and you know and, and hold court, and all, and it was and during that time it was a time when just about anybody who was anybody you know came would here, yeah. uh, would would come in here you know mm-hmm. and it was uh, it was it was really the place of the world to be. It was the exact uh, place to be during the comedy gold you had, rush. You you had Buddy Hackett. Yeah. And, oh yeah, and his sure. son Sandy Hackett, uh, uh, who also was a comedian. Feed, what was feed your face? Uh, Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason. Yeah, he he actually uh, had the the restaurant, for, the a restaurant for a little while. Yeah, and had what I think was a very kind of cute little uh, gimmick on opening night. He had a pure white wall over there. He oh, had yeah? all of the celebrities that came in. Put their handprint up there and sign it. Oh, that's right. And, that's, right. Uh, that's right. Unfortunately, because of the breakup and the way the breakup happened. Yes. But Mark decided to paint over it. I know. I know. That <laughs> but was it, a, it was kind of like a, a, a classic little thing. I promised uh, thing. to do this. I just remembered. This is Paul Wilson, who was on Cheers for a long time. Bernadette Burkett, who's a wonderful actress, also married to George Went. That's Archie Hahn, and uh, here's Archie. Andy Goldberg, and uh, that's uh, Wendy Cutler. And our piano player was Carol Weiss. And who, that was the legitimate cast. Who were the original members of... of uh, uh, well, that was Andy and Wendy. And then, uh, you know, Robin w- was with the group uh, before he was famous. But be- but there were other people uh, who went on to, you know, uh, Tony D'Elia and uh, Chris Thompson. You know, I think Chris Thompson named the, named the group off oh, the wall. Oh, God, Chris Thompson. Yeah, yeah, yeah a lot mm-hmm. of... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and was was D part of the? D original? was always on stage at the beginning, yeah, and she taught an improv class. D had been with a group that was in San Francisco that was not the committee, but was their own group, and they came down here and did quite well. They were on the Tonight Show a number of times, and then D decided to relocate, and she was a wonderful facilitator. You know, she mm-hmm. would introduce a lot of people, and she would uh, sponsor people who she thought you know had uh, had talent, and you know she let Robin Williams sleep on her couch and. You know, the people would show up, and the, 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 I mean, you really couldn't make money performing here when you first got here. You'd have to get on like the dating game or something, because you yes. the, they wouldn't pay it. The clubs wouldn't pay you to perform because it was Hollywood, right? And so people would go into late night uh, delicatessens and steal food. I mean, honest <laughs> to God, I, I, comedians, uh, you know, weren't really making money. To, hmm? Had to do or get a, you know some kind of a straight job for a while, and uh, you know, I remember when David Letterman came out here and. Um, you know, he just had to find a way to uh, to work, you know, and, and to get uh, to get famous right away, because uh, you know there was nobody paying you to be not famous, you know. Well, he did. <laughs> he, he did a a pretty good job. Oh yeah. Of getting uh, famous pretty quick. Oh yeah. It's uh, he and and Leno. You know, and, look, and Jay was Jay. By the way, is a world class guy, very nice gentleman. Just mm-hmm. uh, you know. He used to go out with a girl named Mickey Wolkowitz. Remember Mickey? Yes, I sure do. Yeah. Well, anyway, so he'd come in here with Mickey. And then eventually he found the love of his life, and uh, he's he is he is of all the comedians I've ever met, uh, he's the straightest straight. In other words, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, that's him. Yeah, that's him. That's that's who he is, and he's not a guy that I don't think he drinks. I know he doesn't do any drugs. No, he he doesn't drink, and it, it's uh, his wife, whose name is Mavis. Mavis, yeah, is is also a sweetheart. Oh God, but yeah. he I refer to Jay kind of like as every man. Yes, totally. He's just, he's friends to everybody. Yes. He, uh, I've never seen him, like, turn a fan away or no, no. whatever. Uh, no, he uh, was driving one of his silly cars. You know, he's got, he's got these two garages filled with cars. Seinfeld's the same way. And um, anyway, he and his wife were driving on Sunday in Hollywood, and, and, and these people saw him, them and went, come on, come on, come on. And they, he went, okay. And suddenly they were part of the gay parade. <laughs> and they had no intention of being part of the gay parade, but Jay goes, oh, "I got gay fans." Okay, yeah. <laughs> hi, hi. You know, he didn't care. No, he had uh, when he had just gotten. I think he had been on the Tonight Show maybe a year, and he was sitting here with uh, Mark Lano one Saturday night. The place was just a zoo. Oh yeah. And a couple of people saw him, right? And they were from Michigan, wherever. Sure, Podunk, yeah. And they, you know, they're just about peeing in their pants and they sure. go like oh can we buy him a drink can we buy him a drink I said guys he, he doesn't drink no. uh, so but, but when, when I got guy. when I got a moment I went over there to him and I said uh, 
Jay, the, these two guys at the bar are from so and so, and and they they wanted to buy you a drink, or you know, can I give you a soda or something for them? And he said, well, no, you know, but you you go over there and you tell them if they would like, they can come over and say hello. Very good. And that was like, I mean, the, I'm sure these guys talk about sure. this to this day. Oh my God. I mean, how many people? I there's know. only one other person I can think of that that would do that, and that's Drew Carey. Who is, Drew is another everyman, yes, everyman yes, guy. Yes, the, the two of them together are like, you know, your neighbors next door. Absolutely. You know, but we had some monster comedians, you know. There was a gentleman here named Sam Kennison. God, God rest his soul. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Sam Kennison performed, uh, you know, Sam, I know it's Sam's brother. And Sam, when Sam, when Sam was about nine years old, he was, they were playing in a yard, and he ran out to get a ball, and a milk truck hit him. And oh his brother swears that forever after that, he became this mean-spirited guy. And this is during the AIDS epi epidemic. And let me tell you something. When AIDS first hit, those of you not old enough to recall, it was a, it was a seminal moment. Mm -hmm. It was like everybody was going, can I get this? Is this, is this for everybody? We didn't, nobody knew where it came from. No, and, 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 you know, of course, every comedian has to talk about whatever's going on. Well, of all the comedians, the worst as far as the you know gay community would be concerned, was Sam, Sam Kennison, who would just rag on somebody spitting out of a car. Tell a whole story, and at the end, somebody spits out of a car, and it lands on somebody's cup, and he drinks his gut. I mean, like yeah. he he really was a bit of a nightmare. And and at the end of every show, Sam would stand out here, and as the women would would walk past, he would say hello to them. He'd, and he was looking for the, his date of the night, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we had a lot of people who and were at, less than perfect. At the end of every show, I would steal his keys oh, so yeah. that he could not drive. Oh, yeah. I can't tell you how many times he, he'd yell at oh. me for like, where, where are you? Oh, took my keys, street. didn't you? No, I don't know where they are. It's like, you know, maybe leave your car in, in yeah, the yeah, lot take a overnight. Yeah. yeah, we'll take care of you. We'll, we'll find them overnight. Well, now that you mentioned that, there was a very famous talk show host by the name of Johnny Garson, who would come in here. And Johnny, Johnny was a drinker. Uh, and he would, his, you know, and he was a Scotsman, and his face would get lit up, right? And this happened more than once. But one time, uh, Johnny was too drunk to drive home. So Bud has somebody, a comedian, who's going to drive him or his car. And he says to me, do you want to drive Johnny or do you want to take Johnny's car? And, and I said, the Jaguar? And he goes, yeah. I go, I'll take the car. I don't want to sit with some drunk, you know. So I roar down to you know, Malibu and I've got this great car. And, and then I have to wait for them to show up. And, of course, you know, then I drive back with whoever the hell the comic was. That but, uh, yeah, that Bruce happened Smirnoff more than once. Yeah. That, okay, at, at I think it was, end. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, it, it's a very popular story. Bruce has got it in his book. Really? Bruce did it in, uh, uh, in his one-man play, one-man well, show. it happened whatever. more than once. But definitely Bruce, I remember, the, was a guy mm -hmm. who drove him home. And, you know, that was just Johnny. He would, and then he'd get to, you know, who else was kind of assaultive was Rodney. Rodney Dangerfield would come in here very often, and he would sometimes ridicule people on stage. He, when he went back to the bathroom, he just let his uh, pants drop, you know, <laughs> to, to use the urinal. That's and if he just, had his pants on and not his pajamas. And you'd go like, oh, my God, this was one of the biggest stars in the world. He's just a horrible slob. But he was actually quite nice to a number of friends of mine. He, he did, you know, a lot of specials and... He was fun to work with, but he had a terrible opinion of himself, I'm convinced. I knew Rodney since I was about 17 years old. Is that right? He, uh, he used to work in the Catskill Mountains. Yeah. My, my father was a uh, uh, entertainment uh, social director at, at a hotel, and he was one of the few people, one of the first people to give Rodney work when when a lot of people well, he started didn't want late to give. you know he had been like yeah, a he was in his 40s a house mm -hmm. salesman or something yeah you have a couple of old pictures of me that people might i do not if I, recognize if I them by the, the coffee, by the coffee yeah <laughs> now you destroyed me i mean but you know right. we don't talk about the burn all right oh well, here's a good shot now this is a girl that i went with for two years who mistook me for eddie and uh, that's how I got to know her. And uh, and then ah, yes. later she realized that... <laughs> Show that uh, real close. But it was too... Um, hold it back there. Hold it back there. Okay. Uh, th this it was, uh, this, this was a good, long relationship yes, for was. Tom, yes, pretending he was Eddie Burke. Yes. But it's okay. <laughs> Actually, we both had red hair back then. Yes. So yes, it was yes. totally different. Now show the picture of uh, that handsome young devil. Oh, yeah. They're in here. 
Okay. And, um, Here we go. Let's see. There Upside down. There's a nice shot of Eddie at the bar. And here's a very good shot. I have the Eddie. Okay. Uh, Eddie I'm at looking the bar. at these others. Oh, here's there's another, another one. Yeah, yeah, here's another one. Absolutely. God, how could you not love this handsome devil, right? Right. <laughs> Look at Absolutely. this guy. He's very popular. <laughs> this and here and, we are uh, on stage uh, with Rick Overton. And there's another old girlfriend of mine, yeah. Corley mm -hmm. Jurek, who's been gone for a while. But yeah, um, yeah we had some good times here. Yeah, here's a, a number of pictures of you and uh, off the wall. Here's Sarah, myself at the bar. Sarah Silverman? Yeah, no. Different, different Sarah? Yeah. yeah, these are all pictures, guys, of, uh, you know, we that Tom's had for like uh, 110 years. Yeah. Yeah, it's destroying them. and no, no, no. And here, oh wow, Don Marrera and what's his name? Uh, Richard Kind and no, no, Mike no. Haggerty. Mike Haggerty. Mike Haggerty and Richard Kind. That's yeah. right. Wow. There we are on Haven't stage. seen either one in quite a while. They're around. These are guys that that used to come in here every single night. Both great guys. Oh yeah. Great actors. And there's uh, Tom with uh, one of our previous guests, Mario Rucuzzo. Yep. Who had a couple of stories of his own oh to tell? Oh my God, he'd been around forever. And here is the one of the the original sign on the stage of over one billion jokes told, right. stolen from my over one billion drinks served. Right. <laughs> and this is oh wow, Monty Hoffman. Monty Hoffman. Monty Hoffman, guys. Which, oh, he was may, a veteran of the, of the Vietnam his, War. May he rest in peace. And he was a very funny man. And he was on a show with John. I can't think of his uh, name now, but he, but uh, Drew Carey. Drew Carey. It was Drew but, Carey. But no, show. Oh, John uh, Caponera. Caponera's mm, had a show. Yes. And, you know, Mario did a guest star on the show and said, uh, I said, how was it? He said, oh, there's a guy on the show that's going to be the biggest star in Hollywood. And I go, what's his name? And it, he said, Monty Hoffman. And, of course, Drew Carey was on the show, and he didn't realize that Drew Carey was going to be the biggest star. Right. Well, <laughs> he, he was right in one sense, and that was the, the one of the biggest stars in Hollywood was coming out of that show. Yeah, well, he had but that. But they, they had a great right. little cast. That was John Caponera, yeah. Drew Carey, Monty Hoffman, sure. and uh, I can't recall who else. But the, uh, so, so, the gal, yeah. so many of these guys go way back. Oh, and my they're God. All, uh, and this is another very good mate, gentlemen, by the name of John Mendoza. Oh, yes. And uh, one John, of my best friends. Yeah, John I see all the time still. And yep. John is uh, a very working comic. Oh, Mario's in there, too. And John opens for Howie Mandel everywhere. Yes, he does. He's, yes. uh, he's, and he opens doors for Howie, too, because Howie won't touch and, anything. And, <laughs> that's right. Actually, isn't he credited with starting the fist bump? Yeah, I think he Howie is. Mandel, yeah, Howie Mandel, because, because uh, he, he wouldn't shake not, anybody's um, hand. Shake anybody's hand. Thank I you. know. So uh, yeah, what other what other uh, people can you remember that used to hang out here like uh, Shepard, Sam I mean, Shepard, and here's uh, the thing, yeah, but Sam Shepard, uh, yeah, uh, um, I almost got in a fight with him one night <laughs> over a bar stool. I swear to God, uh, Sam was another drinker, and uh, he was, but but we became friends later. You know who was a great guy and became a fan of ours was Peter Ustinov, and I was just, you know, I'm a big uh, uh, British, mm -hmm. what do they call it? Ophile and I was like overwhelmed that he, but he would come. Oh yes, and he said I could never do that. They, be, invariably, these people would come to the show like Hackman or, or Carol O'Connor, and they just couldn't imagine how we would do what we do, you know. And of course, we were enamored with them because we couldn't touch what they did, you know. Right. And so it was kind of fun. Well, Peter Ustinov, my gosh, he, he's such a, an aberration for this club. Oh my God! You know, yeah. He just well, that's kinda... what I'm saying. We would get people that you wouldn't expect. To right. See people who were running for president. People who were happy. Mike Tyson used to come in here one time, and he gave me a, uh, a thing, and I went like this to him, and you know I could just tell that at any second Mike could hit somebody. <laughs> <laughs> well, back in the day, I mean, everybody and anybody, you name them, they were here. Oh yeah. I mean, was, I remember Streisand, oh, sure. Schwarzenegger, Warren Beatty, Denzel Washington. Yeah. Uh, you name them, and they were here for one reason and, or another. Yeah, and here's the other thing: is is people who were like. Olympic champions who were famous Olga Corbett maybe for a day but mm -hmm. we, you know, we would right. see all the people who were famous just you know for a little while the, the guy that stayed at O.J. Simpson's house um, Marcus uh, who? Cato Cato Kalin. Oh, Cato Kalin. I mean people yes. who had, had just a moment of glory of fame and we got to see that as, as, you know as a cavalcade of life uh, goes by, you Who know. Who became a stand-up comic for a while, by he the did. way, Cato Kalin. Yep, he did. He, did. He, per he performed here a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, now we've had uh, a little modicum of success. I think he appears more now on Howard Stern. Oh yeah, well, you know, we, or whatever he does. All those guys uh, initially the, the the club in New York and the one out here had you would have singers, you would have mm-hmm. comedians, and then you'd have a song. Right. And then then that just uh, all that went away and it just became a comedy club. Yeah, people uh, weren't kind of coming to to see the singers. Oh, I remember. I was going to tell a story about Robin. Um, there was a, I won't even say her name, but, but there was a gal who worked here that had slept with Robin and, and claimed that he, uh, she had given, that he had he given had her given herpes, her, right? Yeah, I remember the story. And mm-hmm. so they, it was a big story in the National Enquirer. Of course, it was true. And so uh, I posted it back behind the bar, and I put a sign underneath that said, Waitresses, uh, please do not sleep with the comics. If you, if you do, wash your hands afterward. But, and Bud was furious, but he never found out it was me. And, and luckily, Loretta didn't tell him because uh, it was just, he, I don't you know, Bud, it would, Bud and Mark would go off. Yeah, I know. And if they didn't like something, never, ever. I mean, it would just be this, this cascade. You'd hear the people that work here being that was, berated. Those were Mark's words. Yes. Never, ever. Never, ever. Yeah, you and will never, ever play here again. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. And then, oh, there's another, if, I, if, you, if, I, if you don't mind. No, go for it. We had, uh, this will be my last story, I promise. Uh, we had a uh, a a, 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 bar, a a guy at the door by the name of Lorenzo Peoples. God sure. rest his soul. Mm-hmm. He, he was in Nam, and what happened was he had m- murdered a guy in a bar fight in St. Louis. I don't know if you know this, but he uh, he did a year and a half for it, and then he they gave him a deal that he w- if he went into the Marines for four years, he could uh, leave jails, prison. So he did, and he came back from uh, you know from uh, Nam. He was very peaceful loving guy mm-hmm. and he was his cousin was Bob Lanier who was a 6 foot 11 inch uh, center for the Detroit Pistons now Lorenzo wasn't tall tall about 6 foot 1 but he was a very strong Wide, gentleman yeah. mm-hmm. okay so one night we had these 15 people white people from South Africa Lorenzo was was black and so the 15 white people from South Africa show up now what we didn't know was they had just been kicked out of the comedy store so they come into the room and we're on stage and we're doing our little improv show and, and uh, there was a woman who, who was their ringleader who was just a mean, obnoxious jerk. And finally, uh, you know, they, they, they weren't going to pay for their, they ordered drinks and they wouldn't pay for them. And so Mark said, look, you don't have to pay the cover and you don't have to pay the minimum, but you have to pay for any drink that you ordered, okay, because you drank it, you know. And so, and so they decided to leave in mass, 15 people. Suddenly, a huge fight broke out, and in, and, and and like, the, we were on stage, and like it just so happened I wasn't in, in the scene, but th- but this big noise, much bigger than our noise, is in the in the in the showroom, wh- because the whole place. And then Mark's wife runs into the showroom, and she goes, "They're beating my husband! They're beating my husband!" <laughs> and I go, "Okay, everybody, keep your keep your keep your seat." <laughs> so I run out here, and I down. see Lorenzo hitting guys. Boom! One guy. Boom, another guy. Boom, a third guy. I mean, just knocking these white South African people, guys, all over the place. And, and the woman got her wrist broken. She later sued. But anyway, I, I ran back into the show and I went, they're rehearsing a scene. <laughs> I, just, I, I just, I don't know where that came from. But everybody, oh, I don't okay. know where that came from either. And they that. thought the whole audience just settled down and we just continued the show. And I think you jumped over the bar, whoever was working that, here. That did. sounds very familiar, and that, that sounds uh, just like Lorenzo. That also oh. sounds like Mark. I mean, Mark would always Mark be in the middle. Mark was in the, the middle, middle of the fight, always. absolutely. But he was, he was pummeled. He was, he, getting pummeled? he was getting pummeled because he was outnumbered. But uh, it was a wild, it was, a, it was one of the, it was the wildest night in the history of the improv. What was your, um, your uh, contact with Bruce, with Willis? You know, it's, he was a funny guy. Bruce has gotten a lot of heat because of his uh, personality, but um, he had done a TV show where he played two characters, and uh, and I got to know him by sitting down next to him and saying to him, and he knew me from the stage, and I said, you know, I, I really like that thing you did on that Twilight Zone, but I hated that other guy who was, <laughs> who was it was <laughs> the him, other right? character. He goes, yeah, I hated that guy too, you know. <laughs> so we got along good. He used to, remember he came in, he would buy like. Three hundred dollars worth of lottery tickets. You know, he's yes, we used to sell lottery tickets when they first came yeah. out. Yeah, mm-hmm. and when Bruce, see, when Bruce Willis first had money, he's like anybody else that has money. They just throw it away. They don't mm-hmm. know. They've never had money before. And Bruce right. was a bartender. You know, in so, New York. Yes. Yeah, in New York. And he, Cafe you know, Central. 
he, he, he was somebody that I personally got along with. Uh, he would bring girls back to his place, and they had other stories. Uh, again, I wasn't there, so I'm not going to quote them, but it, it was... Um, it was a different time, you know. Now, this Me Too movement uh, yeah, was not you, in the 80s. Okay? No, he used to, I'll tell you, so many nights he would just take a bunch of people back. Yes. He had a place in the hills, and they would just go up there. But and, they generally had a good time, you know. Oh, they did, except the nights they got arrested. The I nights, mean, yes. uh, that you know, the, the, the cops would be <laughs> called, and uh, the neighbors would be complaining about 3, 4 in the morning that oh, there's... Sure. Uh, 15 people in, in his swimming Naked pool. Naked in the swimming pool, sure, absolutely. Yelling, screaming, oh, and, yeah. and what have you. Oh, yeah. But when he was here, he would he was, uh, actually, he was the same way. He was oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. singing with John Goodman. To oh, the sure, jukebox. Goodman was always, yeah, yeah, Constantly. Penny Marshall. Mm-hmm, they, and that was there, they had that kind of fun, and they were It was their town, you know, they, yep. they, they owned this city for, for the time, for, for the brief time that they had their, their hit shows and their hit series, and everybody... And again, the, the crowds were, it was, it, yeah. was, it was right out of... Uh, um, I know, it, it was, it's kind of funny. I remember uh, Bruce here one night and he's, there, and he's so used to everybody giving him attention when, yeah. when they come out of the showroom. And there happened to have been a young man here who was a friend of Bruce's and also a well-known actor named Michael J. Fox. Oh, yes. With him. And Michael's... I guess show was still in the heat of it all. Sure. Anyway, it, it's like uh, everybody was stopping to either take a picture or something with Michael J. Fox. Yeah. Uh-huh. And not with Bruce. And Bruce found it very necessary to start singing at the top of oh, his yeah. lungs. Oh, yeah. So to the jukebox so that people would go, hey, that's Bruce Willis. But no, they, they, they stuck with... Uh, with, I know. with Michael J. Fox, there have uh, been yeah. a number of celebrities who have uh, had their egos bruised. I'll tell you a true story. I was in the in the, in the uh, men's room one night. And tell J- us a fake story. Don't no, tell us a fake story. I, 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 I could. I, I'm a very good liar, but these are all true. Uh, anyway, this Jerry Seinfeld, uh, you know, who I knew quite well uh, from the club, uh, you know, came in and he was just a wreck. He was very depressed, and it was during the, the height of the Seinfeld shows you know mm-hmm. like the third year or second year or something and i looked at him and i said jerry if if you if that if, if if this is what it brings you okay just walk away from it you don't need that show you know what if it's if, if you know because i guess he was going through the breakup with with larry david and his the girlfriend thing was up the wall and the public and and i i don't know that any anybody can be prepared for that level of uh celebrity yeah because they aren't and when it happens, people don't realize that they can't go out, get out of their car, and put gas in their car. They literally can't leave the house. I've, I've, you know, unfortunately, I've never experienced that. But I can imagine that at the very. I was talking with somebody last night about that. Uh, I forget who was here, but we were talking about being famous and a celebrity. At the very beginning, it has to be so ego boosting. Oh yeah. Oh but yeah. But then after a while, you have to go like. I'm just going to the bathroom. Well, Bill Murray uh, said uh, to his brother Joel that, because uh, somebody said, gee, I'd like to be rich and famous. And Bill said, try just being rich. Yeah. See if that's not enough. <laughs> because well, the famous thing already. Because literally, and then the people are very offended if you don't spend five minutes with them. Oh, And you yeah, might have to they, pick your kid up from school, but they don't care. No, they take it personally. It's Paul McCartney was here one night, and, yeah. and uh, this is kind of funny. It's... Uh, I think in the hallway was Judd Apatow and Rogan and uh, uh, Avery that used to work here. And McCartney goes into the bathroom and, and so they all stay out and McCartney comes out and uh, one of them, I don't know if it was Avery, says to him, you know, we, we really wanted to say hello, Paul, but you know, we knew you were going to the bathroom so we were, you know, and, and maybe take a picture or whatever. He goes, Oh no! Come on in. He takes them all into the bathroom, and he takes pictures with them in the oh, bathroom. That's, that's great. You've got Avery sticking his head over uh, one of the right, uh, right. one of the stalls. Well, and you know he's been a celebrity for a long time, and he's he's, he's gotten to uh, to know how to deal with it. But he knew it. You know, he killed his best friend. 
you know, that's, uh, somebody stalked John Lennon and killed him because he was famous and he wasn't, you know. Oh, some, I thought you said somebody, oh, okay. I so, you, said you know what I'm saying is, him. yeah, that's oh, what no, I no, said. No, no. He killed his best friend. No, no, no. celebrity did. <laughs> celebrity killed No, him. somebody killed, yeah, no, that's true. Celebrity did, yeah. No, in, insanity did, yeah, and that no, was totally. on that guy, totally. on that guy's part. But it was, uh, but again, to, just to wrap it up, again, the, the late 70s, early 80s, um, you know, you sort of had to be here, and uh, it was just this massive number of people that showed up wanting to get on stage and uh the the crowds uh, you know were were just like everywhere, every night every night and uh it was it was a uh, a very wild time filled with a lot of very bad things that, 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 that <laughs> took away a number of our good friends <laughs> but and uh, bad things and good things all at the same time and yet i got to meet a good friend of mine Tom, thank Edinburgh. you thank you so much for doing this i really appreciate it before you go i have a little present for oh you oh my god this is uh where did i go here it is this okay. is our uh collector's item okay. t-shirt very which good. by the way if you guys start saying things on Facebook, I may start selling these. Uh -huh. This is uh, Eddie's Bar at the Improv okay. Podcast right here. And this is for you. Thank you. I also, uh, I may as well advertise, may be starting to sell these hats again. Uh, this is the only one I have. This is a prototype. Uh, don't I look great? Absolutely. Wonderful. Absolutely. Another 40 years. Yes. Oh, God. No. <laughs> anyway, Tom, thank pleasure. you so much. My I pleasure. really appreciate it. Absolutely. Mike Carano, thank you so much. I can't do this without you, bud. Uh, we will see you next time. Peace.